Thanks. I, uh, I hope you all enjoyed the break uh, and, uh, and are enjoying the stories being told so far at uh, TEDxGIS. Uh, and I hope you shared some of the stories as Aleka encouraged us about who we are and where we come from. Uh, and maybe some of these stories that have been told so far have taken you on a journey, inspired you, or inspired some of the conversations uh, with your friends and family that are here today. I hope so because that's what I'm talking about is story experiencing. What we do in experiencing story, uh, how we buy into it, uh, and why it matters um, to us. So with that, I'll start with a story. In 2012, we put on a production of Dracula. Now, uh, doing horror in live theater is challenging. Our measure of success was for just 10 seconds, sometime during the performance, to have audience genuinely scared, just 10 seconds. We set up the stage, uh, the, the performance space on stage. We had them enter in from uh, the side through an insane asylum so that audience was immersed in the world of the play from their very first steps in. Uh, it seemed to be working pretty well. We had a good opening night. Uh, at one point in the show, Van Helsing, the hero of rationality and science, faces off against the supernatural Count Dracula. And Dracula holds him at bay with a dagger. And he's threatening to kill Seward, the head of the insane asylum. And it's at that moment that Seward takes the dagger, plunges it into himself, sacrificing and clearing the way for Van Helsing to chase down, corner, and destroy Dracula. Second eye of the performance, live theater happened. Dracula forgot the dagger. So there he is, threatening to kill Seward with his thumb. And I waited for that laughter. And I waited for that moment that was going to destroy the moment, destroy the performance, and perhaps the rest of the run. Nothing. The audience watched in rapt attention as Van Helsing stalked, Dracula threatened, and Seward killed himself with the thumb of death. And I was confounded by that. Um, Samuel Coleridge coined the phrase, the willing suspension of disbelief. But to be confronted with it was confounding. How could they not see the absurdity of it? I asked a colleague who had seen it, and he said, yeah, it's Dracula, I guess he can kill him with his thumb. <laughs> so how do we fall into our stories? How are we transported? How do we buy into it? Um, and neuroscience has some of the answers, I think. Uh, one of them, as we saw in that video, is our brains process our sensory evidence and make decisions for us. Lisa Barrett, a neuroscientist, says, we do not experience the real world. We experience our best guess at what's going on, our brain's best guess at what's going on in the real world, what our processing is going on in our brains. Um, two footprints in the sand. Rotate the image 180 degrees, and now they look embossed. They're coming up out of the sand. Our brain's best guess, the assumption, the unconscious assumption that's happening is that light comes from above. So it shifts our perception of what's going on. So our brains are making a lot of decisions for us in our perceptions. When we're experiencing theater or story, that's what's happening. Our brain is interpreting all of our sensory data. And some of that uh, some of that data, as long as we're okay with what's happening, we're going along with the story. Jerome Brunner, a psychologist, says we have two types of thinking, narrative thinking and analytic thinking. Uh, a Nobel laureate economist Daniel Kahneman has the same sort of theory in thinking fast and slow. In fast thinking or narrative thinking, we're using these unconscious bias, beliefs, assumptions, the brain's best guesses to just 
process what's going on and react to it. Uh, in theater, as long as we are our behavior is truthful to the imaginary circumstances we've created, the audience will go along with us, and we carry on, and we're with the story. And then at the end, when the curtain comes down and the lights come up and we applaud, that's when we ramp up our cognitive effort. We engage our disbelief. We turn to our friends and family, and we say, wow, that was amazing, that was good. Did you see that? Oh, it was so bad. It was, it was so whatever. But now we're ramping up our cognitive effort. We're in analytical or slow thinking. We're beginning to have a conversation. We're talking about it. We're, we're deciding on the reality. We're confirming the reality and the truth of our shared experience with the people around us. And in this day and age, of unending tweet storms, of the stories all around us that don't seem to end, that are in our lives, our screens, our notifications, 24-hour news cycle. Every now and then, I think it's really important to stop, to understand our willing and sometimes unwilling suspension of disbelief. How is it that we buy into so much? How do we, how, why is it we care about our stories? Giacomo Rizzolatti, a neuroscientist, was studying macaque monkeys, studying motor control neurons, how we, our brains control our, our bodies to reach out and grab something. And what he did was he studied, uh, they wired up the brains, and when a monkey reached out to grab a peanut, they could detect the signals of the neurons. What they discovered was that if the monkey's just sitting there watching another monkey reach out and grab that peanut, the same thing happens. Those neurons fire. They're mirror neurons. Monkey see, monkey do in the head. Christian Kieser in the Netherlands studies these human neuron, mirror neuron systems in humans. He uh, studies sensation, intention, emotion. Did one study, fMR brain imaging, where a person smelled something that was really actually quite disgusting and their face would be like, ugh. And then they watched an actor do the same thing with a cup. Smell it, not really bad, but just screw up their face in disgust. Same areas in the brain are activating. The implication for actors and audience, when you see the performer emote or do something, you feel it too. If he's up there smiling and having a good time and he looks out at you, you want to smile too. Right? Humans see, human feel. Empathy. We care. But what about those moments when things happen and, and it just is so crazy? How can we ignore that? It's a concept of perceptual blindness or inattentional blindness, eloquently demonstrated by Dan Simmons in the Invisible Gorilla Experiment. Subjects watch a video. Two groups of people. People in white shirts, people in black shirts. Each group has a basketball. And they're passing the basketball back and forth between their group. And the groups are mixing in and out. The subjects are told, count the number of basketball passes by the people in the white shirts. So they're watching. Then, about halfway through, a guy in a gorilla suit comes in, waves at the camera, and then walks off. Consistently, just under half of the subjects don't see the gorilla. They don't notice the gorilla. And they're astounded afterwards to go, oh my god, there's a gorilla. How could I miss that? We have a, gr a very powerful disposition when we're engaged and focused to ignore what is plainly visible to us. And it's these powers, this, this ability to care and ignore that I think is important for us to step out of our small screen, to step outside that small screen, to step out of all those unending stories, to close the book, to let the credits roll, to let the curtain fall, to reach out to friends, reach out to family, have a conversation, confirm our shared reality, our shared truth of experience. 
The bread and butter of a magician is misdirection. In theater, we call it direction. Give the audience too much predictability, ah, they're bored. Give them too little predictability, and they give up in chaos and confusion. The best craft lies somewhere in between. As Seth Anil describes it, when prior beliefs dance with sensory evidence in just the right way, the willing suspension of disbelief, even for a thumb of death. Thank you.